Hello, I hope everyone's doing well after lunch and not too tired. Uh, the Mario Kart was amazing, I'm glad to follow that. But uh, today's talk is about the art and science of software development. And based on the talk we just saw, I think we can all firmly appreciate that this craft requires both. And, but if we look around the room, I think we're gonna have different ideas about where the art starts and the science begins. Art is sometimes hard to justify, and science is sometimes hard to you know, work effectively within. Sometimes if we get too scientific, we get blocked. If we get too artistic, we get too all over the place. Today's talk is about the multi-arm bandit algorithm, which you probably already make use of either implicitly or explicitly, but I'd like to sort of hope that you come away from this talk understanding that it can play a bigger role in your day-to-day -day software development experience. But first, the question that might be on your mind. Yeah, who, who are you and what are you doing here, really? So I'm Ben Halpern. I'm here to talk a bit about gambling, with software wisdom included in the talk a little bit, I hope. I'm a software developer and a founder, so I hope that gives me a bit of wisdom uh, across the aisle, across the different concerns that we have to deal with, and hopefully we become software developers that are better able to serve business needs and better able to communicate sort of across the, the, the different folks within our team. So dev is a space for software developers to express themselves creati creatively, and we hope to connect folks with interesting ideas and interesting people every so often. Uh, J'ai grandi au Canada, j'ai appris le français, mais je ne parle pas beaucoup, donc uh, s'il vous plaît, pas de questions compliquées uh, en français. Um, one fact about me, though, uh, I am a two-time mutton-busting champion back in Nova Scotia when I was young. What is mutton-busting, you ask? Mutton-busting is the ancient sport of uh, strapping children into a hockey helmet, plopping them on top of uh, a sheep, letting the sheep run wild, and then timing how long it takes for the child to fall off the sheep. So if my ideas sound like they come from someone who's fallen off one too many sheep in their lifetime, uh, please show some grace. So let's start by really honing in on uh, the art to, uh, of this conversation to start. So in many ways, uh, my story uh, with Dev begins with uh, a phase of, of art in the early days. And it's really the art of shit posting on the internet. So it all starts when Twitter was Twitter, and uh, this guy, Jack Dorsey, was in charge. Uh, seems like forever ago, simpler times. Speaking of forever ago, uh, I used to make these parody book covers. Uh, it really helped sort of popularize this meme, if you ever saw these around. Uh, if you're too young, uh, this is O'Reilly Publishers. They used to be huge. I think they still are, but who reads books anymore? And uh, who copies and pastes from Stack Overflow anymore? Uh, it's probably time for a, a modern edition. Back when I was doing these, I felt like this was the, the biggest problem I was facing in, in JavaScript development in particular. I think that this problem has somewhat kind of faded away. I think we've settled into, uh, you know, a little bit of our lanes. Of course, sometimes I think you're going to find yourself doing this. Uh, but really, these days, you know, when I look up... <laughs> When I look up uh, technologies like Use Memo, I get inspired to create, you know, parodies like this. So this is a this is an original for the talk. Uh, so is this one. When I think about where I've come uh, as a software developer, but at the end of the day, we're all trying to solve our issues the best we can. So let's get to the real issue of all of this. I have no idea what's funny. <laughs> And I'm just trying stuff. I wish I could leak out you know, my ideas to a few people for, for feedback and do that systematically. Uh, but that is uh, complicated and sort of takes away from the fun. And, and really, uh, if we did that with our art, we'd probably end up making dumber art. So it's probably a good thing we don't do this too systematically. But in our line of work, while we want to appreciate the art, we also want to approach our problems with a more rigorous standard, a structure that normalizes our expectations and ultimately yields verifiably optimal outcomes, for the most part. So let's talk about the science of today's presentation. 
we're going to be talking about the multi-arm bandit algorithm, which is a framework for data-oriented decisions when existing data is insufficient and optimal outcomes are not necessarily binary. So this is often referred to as the explore-exploit algorithm. Uh, you might refer to it as reinforcement learning or any other number of names. You could also call it explore-scale. Uh, these are you know, ways to refer to this algorithm. Uh, and you might use explore-scale if explore-exploit seems like it's too on the nose for whatever your company is doing. So the multi-arm bandit algorithm uh, we're going to sort of go through it in case you're familiar with it. This is a refresher, or this might be a new concept to you, uh, depending on your background in software. So the multi-arm bandit algorithm refers to slot machines, historically known as one-arm bandits, for, you know, for some reason, because there's one arm. That's, you know, that's the deal. So a multi-arm bandit um, is a process uh, of optimizing for your outcomes if you're going to play the slots. So these machines are set up by casinos to have different rates to get people to come in and be excited that maybe the next machine is going to pay out better than the last one. Each machine is fine-tuned slightly differently, and they really want to keep you playing and, and, and you know, have you think the next payoff is good. When a gambler has access to only one machine, they only have one way to play the game. You know, pull the arm, hope for the best. When a gambler has access to multiple machines, now we have options. And here's our gambler. Uh, we're She's going to be the star of the show. <laughs> so let's start by playing the machines randomly, because we don't really have a better way, uh, and start to gain some information about what pays off. This is basically known as the e-greedy approach to the multi-arm bandit algorithm. We uh, don't expect black and white results uh, early on, uh, but we're going to gain information and tailor our expected outcomes as evidence unfolds. Once we have some confidence of the best machine we should start playing, we're going to play that machine more often, say, you know, 80% of the time. But we're still going to keep experimenting because we might have gotten that first uh, guess wrong. So we're going to play the best machine that we know of 80% of the time, uh, but we're going to keep sampling from the rest of the machines uh, to make sure that we are actually uh, you know, pursuing the optimal outcome. Uh, all that is to say we want some confidence that we're doing the best thing, uh, but we're really not sure. Uh, so we're sort of just going to keep playing and keep adjusting our, our algorithm uh, as we go. Let's talk about some confidence. Because I, I really do think in software development, we sometimes get too laser focused on what it means to make data-oriented decisions. And I think these three ideas are a good framework for effectively communicating data-oriented communicating data decisions. So these are three ideas, being data-driven, data-informed, and data-inspired. Being data-driven can refer to strictly relying on the data, and there's no way you're going to make a decision that does not back up the data exactly. Data-informed means that you're going to principally rely on the data, but add context that's going to help the data you know, come together in a better light so that each decision you make is still inspired, yeah, informed by the data, but relies on other signals that might not strictly be data. And then to be data inspired is to take in the data, but really rely on common sense to ultimately make your decision. And I find that this is important because you want to make decisions with data, but you want to have a culture where you're not making decisions maniacally on being like, quote, data driven and having arguments about whether you've achieved statistical significance or, or anything like that, because I think that that's a hard bar to cross. And I think that folks wind up sort of fudging the numbers, kind of making up a narrative to support being data driven, when really, if we all agreed we were more data informed, that might be a better solution you know, for the problem at hand. But back to the casino, where we generally probably will make data driven choices because this is a pretty closed game. We might layer in a little bit of common sense if we have an idea that maybe the casino lays out the slot machines in a certain way to attract gamblers in some way. So we just know that, so we're going to sort of put that into our algorithm a little bit. But for all intents and purposes, it might be best to be you know, strictly uh, data driven. At this point, we've been playing some slot machines. And the one in the bottom left here, bottom right, uh, is, is the one we've determined is paying out the best. So as soon as we can have some confidence that this is paying out the most, we're going to start paying, playing it more often. 
And we're not going to sample randomly until we are certain what the best one is, because that's a missed opportunity to maximize our payout. And in the real world, a lot of the time, you do not want to spend three months sampling randomly to find out what the optimal algorithm is when your users, your system is relying on random sampling for three months. A lot of the time, you want results a lot sooner than that, but you don't want to pick a winner you know, for once and for all too quickly either. This is the algorithm for deciding to pursue an optimal outcome while continuing to sample and better understand what your options are as you go. So we're going to keep playing. Uh, as we go, we're going to put more and more stock into what we consider uh, our, our best version of the winner. And if, if new results come to light, we're going to change. And we're going to keep doing this until we re result, re return to the ultimate outcome, whatever we're looking for. In this case, it's a beautiful mosaic. So if I had the opportunity to leak out my material, I would test a little bit with a lot of people, start showing the right joke to more people, uh, you know, to really maximize who gets the best joke. Uh, or I just choose whatever I think is the funniest in the moment, and, and we run with it. So the multi-arm bandit in practice. We talked about you know, maybe the art of decision making. And a lot of times in software development, the art of software development is really writing good code that you know is the best, or that your company has culturally determined you know, is appropriate, or that, you're, that meets the spec that your designer put in place, uh, et cetera. And these are all really good ideas, um, but I, I think they do not always result in effective communication. Uh, the loudest voice in the room often wins. And a lot of the time, if we can, we want to put ourselves in the position to optimize our outcomes uh, by putting infrastructure in place to have sort of the data tell the story. Um, so at, at Dev, uh, we use this algorithm a lot. So our, our product, we, we try to connect people with uh, content and people that might be interesting to them. We didn't always do this effectively. In fact, when we first gained popularity, I think we did this really poorly. I think we had a hard time separating signal from noise. Uh, right here, I have a picture of two different sign-up call to actions. And these are important, because we want to tell you that if you're visiting the site, there's a reason you might want to you know, join the community, get involved, maybe write and publish and, and share with others. Uh, and we're never really sure you know, what the best copy is. And, you know, you've probably seen this before via A-B testing or you know, any other frameworks. Um, but I, I really think if you bake this into the infrastructure of what you're doing, you can use this problem-solving this problem approach uh, on really any challenge. So we, of course, use these for emails, for the feeds, for call to actions, for other sorts of recommendations. We also use this within code uh, you know, whenever we can uh, you know, from a performance optimization perspective. Uh, and really, if you kind of lean into this approach, you can kind of see where you ultimately use it more often, and you can make co changes consistently, which you can sort of verifiably determine and improve the service. So let's talk about UX optimization with a pretty simple example of conversion rates on a landing page. This is a classic you know, marketer's problem. And when we are looking to solve for this kind of problem, it is the case that sometimes the appropriate approach is to let marketers deal with it, let them use a, uh, you know, a third-party A-B testing tool, you know, whatever. But a lot of the times as developers, we understand, and especially you know, JavaScript developers, I think understand this you know, above all else, that you know, if you don't invest in the right tooling and the right approach in the infrastructure where you need to, you're going to wind up with just a million libraries pulled together, stuff that conflicts on the front end, stuff that you know, goes completely untested, you have no idea what's going on. So it's often you know, relevant and useful to build your infrastructure yourself, as long as that's you know, the most important part of, of your business outcomes. So here we're going to allocate most of the uh, winners to so the top 90% of converted variations. And we're going to do that basically as soon as we have an idea of what's converting. We're going to start sending that out 90% of the time in this idea. There's a, different, a few different ways to do it. But as soon as that as soon as a variation becomes the one we're testing to most people, it quickly gets challenged on whether it's the winner or not. So if it's the early winner and it's not statistically significant, just by the organic process of it being out in the wild more often, it's gonna, if, it's, if it's meant to be, if it's meant to be the one that converts the best, it's going to stay out there the longest. 
And it's quickly going to fall back, and something else is going to rise to the top if it ultimately was not the one to convert. So we're going to keep sampling. Everything's going to keep sort of fighting for its, its way to be the landing page we actually show. But we do this systematically so that results can be organic and verifiable. We can do the same thing with, you know, say, performance optimization, something that doesn't change the outcome of what the user is looking at. We can use a success metric, like P95 performance uh, of a web page load. Uh, we can do the same thing, different variations of the same sort of page, algorithm, uh, database query. And we can see live what's converting the best. We can immediately start sending most traffic to the best version of our approach. And if that is not the best version, we organically let it sort of fall away. So when using the multi-arm bandit to determine to pick software, uh, I like to think about a few things. So I like to use shallow abstractions, more copying and pasting versus deep reuse, uh, more temporary code, but with checks and balances so that we can remove it when we're done with the process. Uh, so do repeat yourself and, and you know, allow yourself to choose the right test for the job, et cetera. I think we want to use tools you know, such as dynamic, dynamic import here, you know, whatever the environment or our tooling framework gives us to ultimately make use of this algorithm. So the algorithm is not a set of tools. It's not something super specific. But it's an idea we can kind of use you know, whatever our patterns are to achieve. Uh, again, I think this is an algorithm that shows up sort of all over the place. A lot of ways you might A-B test or multivariate test are just, in fact, a version of this algorithm. Uh, you know, canary deployments, you know, depending on how you approach them, depending on how you think about it, it's a version of this algorithm. I think if you are doing too many things that do not have like strict systematic outcomes or are overly binary, I would say that that's not practicing this. Just, you know, if the test pass or fail, I don't think that's necessarily testing this. Uh, but if you're testing for you know, an array of options and, and allowing the best ones to rise to the top, I think that's practicing this algorithm. And so you know, load balancing, feature flagging, smoke testing, uh, machine learning is you know, constantly using this algorithm. And then I really think if you take it you know, to its deepest roots you know, in your practices in your organization, I think you can start talking in, in these terms. Uh, when making decisions. So I think early on in a project, you're usually in the explore mode. And uh, I think once you've achieved some success and you can kind of verify, OK, things are working, we really want to make this uh, work for more customers, we want to roll this out to more people, or you know, we just want to invest in this idea so that we're, we continue to focus. Then we get into scale mode, or exploit mode, if, if, if you want to call it that. Uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, this requires alignment and speaking in these terms allows us to, to better align, because the people who like explore mode are not always the same ones who like scale mode. So if you sort of like all of a sudden, you've been emphasizing, let's explore, let's explore, let's find our options, and then one day we're saying, hold on, let's woe our horses, stop exploring, let's get in. You know, I think that is where tension arises, and I think if you don't know that this is what you're getting in for and express this pre preemptively, you know, I think that we sort of find ourselves uh, getting misaligned, sort of bickering over approaches, like you know, not settling and, and not going with what works. So ultimately, I talked about you know, ways we can use this approach uh, for success. But I also want to really caution you to not overuse it and, and use it when your outcomes are worthy of these decisions. And I think the scientific, data-informed, data-driven approach is most useful when we have big outcomes. And I think when the decision just needs to be made, we're maybe better off not over-testing it, over-verifying, over-exploring, and we want to rely on the art of doing great software development, trusting an individual decision maker. But we do want to use a framework like this when we have the opportunity to achieve a great outcome, one that we have a hard time relying on past data to accomplish, and where future data can really help us get to an outcome really quickly. And then one final thought. As variants get cheaper in the future, as more code is generated automatically, which one way or another is happening more today than it was yesterday, and tomorrow probably will happen more than today, 
I think these frameworks for getting feedback become more important. So when we are getting the code for cheap, or the content for cheap, way cheaper than it used to cost to create a variation of an approach, uh, we really, really, really want to think about the infrastructure for getting feedback and ultimately choosing safe, effective, quality software uh, that scales and is optimized for user needs and system needs. So I ask you to please treat these ideas with care and happy coding. Thank you. <laughs>